Okay, so this is the 21st lecture in the series about creating an international sustainable civilization. And this particular lecture is focusing on how Indonesia made the transition to colonialism and um, the problems in Indonesia are problems for all the developing nations. And then there are certain problems he talks about that are also true of my country and probably all the developed na nations as of 2024. So I am recording these lectures in the month of June, 2024, um, the Trump versus Biden election is heating up. Uh, the What Trump promises, Steve Baden, um, Bannon and other Trump uh, enablers who Trump has already indicated that he is going to hire in positions of authority are extremely authoritarian. So I am really worried about my country, but I don't want leaders in developing countries to get sucked into America's problems. I do want them to be aware of patterns, but they do have to worry about their own countries. They have a responsibility to their own countries and not to be so obsessed about countries that they can't control just to keep learning the lessons. I myself have, I'm sure, spent too much time worrying about things I can't control as I watched my country devolve into a more class-based. I watched the middle class disappear, shrink, ever since 1980, and it's always been a worry to me. I think, to some extent, I should have followed the story, and it should have been a worry. But sometimes I feel like I spend too much time on it and I need to lead my own country. I've always had students. I've always been able to tell them, you need to lead. These are the things you need to know to lead your yourself, your family, your country into the next generation. So that's what I would, so this one is Marif speaking about what he wants, the, the weaknesses, the hypocrisy related to Islam. Now this is true for any religion. Mr. Modi in India is doing it with Hinduism. Trump is doing it with Christianity. I think in Europe, because it's a more secular, uh, culture, they tend to do it with nationalism, patriotism, but it's the same basic process. Create, it plays on people's phobias and their fantasies. That's why actually Plato's dialogues are just as good a starting point as anything. Um, that was my favorite, is to start with Plato. But anyway, okay. So this is about colonialism, the legacy of colonialism. Quote, because of its strategic geopolitical location and its rich earth abundantly supporting human life, Nusantara, or Indonesia, was a target for other nations in pursuit of various interests, religious, economic, and commercial, cultural, and later colonialization. Of course, you know, this is why you have Confucians, they came from China, you have Hindus and Buddhists, they came from India, you have Muslims, they came from the Mideast, and you have the Dutch, and you have the Portuguese, right? They all came to exploit your resources. Um, Arif describes the history of colonialism, and then he concludes the colonial system is in the, is the skeleton in the closet of civilization. Human conscience must oppose this system, whatever the people, whatever the religion. And this is true. This is where I, this is a more unit. These are more universal trends. 
and they're true throughout the world, trying to get past colonialism. Okay. The Dutch and other colonial powers were barbarians who treated other people coarsely and rapaciously. And that's true, you know, in the name of civilization, in the name of equal rights. So it makes complete sense to me that the founders of Indonesia did not want to have a political ideology that was a carbon copy of the Dutch or the West because of the way they treated Indonesians. Why would they want to have the same set of values if that's what it actually meant? But ironically, he says, after independence was won, that same coarseness and rapacity were imitated by the authorities of the independent nation. This has been the tragedy of history suffered by many newly independent nations after World War II. Like so many other nations, Indonesian nationalism has two inseparable goals, banishing colonialism and struggling to establish humane and just values. Of course, Gandhi was the ultimate case of someone who finally got rid of the British and then the Hindus and Muslims started to um, go to, you know, have a lot of animosity. And then there was the separation of Pakistan from India. I mean, it was heartbreaking. Gandhi felt like a failure by the end of his life. So he is, he's the classic case. He's the magnified case. So when it happens in Indonesia, it's important to make sure you understand the pattern and you call it out in your own leaders and your own elite class. The political corruption of Islam. So Islam is now becoming increasingly a doctrine justifying flawed and immoral political behavior. So in the Mideast, the things that go on, one can find similar doings not only here, but in all Muslim countries, Islam has been made into a commodity of power politics on a global scale. Very true. It isn't just Islam, right? It's good that he calls out his own. It's best for everybody to call out the thing that they were raised to love, the thing that they still have allegiance to, and they think critically about it. So um, Americans who identify closely with Christianity should be the most critical of the corruptions of Christianity because they should care the most about those. And so Marif cares about Islam and he cares about what Muhammad really wanted to do. And so it's painful to him to watch it become corrupted. The main cause of the occasional conflicts in the modern era has not been religious differences, but rather economic and political interests exploited by irresponsible and parochial provocateurs, right? So religion is just being used as a weapon to cover up the real motives, which is money and power. Okay, the behavior of party elites in Indonesia there's not a lot of difference between those elites who claim to believe in divine revelation and those who couldn't be bothered with religion. They all get down together in the mud of dirty politics, corruption, opportunism, and cheap pragmatism. In such a political culture, democracy has been made a tool, not to struggle for justice and prosperity of the people, but for the interests of the elite and the groups that support them. Thus, democracy in the hands of the opportunists can become a disaster for the entire nation. So when the leaders say they care about democracy, all they want to do is get the public to trust them and vote for them. And then all they do once they get power is hand it to their family and friends, uh, give government contracts to all of their enablers, and their political contributors. But this happens everywhere, right? It happens in the US, but it happens 
in many, many countries. I just found out yesterday that the amount of money spent on the election for the leader, the prime minister of Britain, was the same amount of money as spent in one House of Representatives primary election in the U.S. Oh my gosh. So you multiply that times 100 Senate seats, 240 representatives in the U.S. in, the, in Washington, then all the local uh, state Senate, state House of Representatives, state governor. It's unbelievable how much money we spend on politics. But it hides behind religion and it hides behind freedom. So in our country, freedom just means don't tax the rich. And we're a good example. You know, we're just so exposed. It's so obvious. It should be obvious, especially to people outside of the U.S. And then they can compare that to Indonesia. So if Indonesia, are Indonesian leaders behaving like U.S. leaders and um, centralizing their power and wealth? So we have become the negative example, the example of how to lose a democracy instead of how to maintain it. The other uh, point that's important to make is that um, in the tradition of Ish-Jihad, ish scholars want to integrate reason and revelation, and the scholars that were at the Pontifical Academy said that, but because of this corruption, that's obvious because of the ways that greedy and power-hungry people clearly refer to revelation in order to get uh, you know, to manipulate or to be able to claim something that they can't argue rationally about is a serious problem. So I would think that any Muslim who in theory wants to integrate reason and revelation in practice has to make sure they, they uh, point out that whatever they think is revelation is very consistent with reason. It's just that it comes from their heart or it comes from their relationship to God. For example, uh, they it's just intuitively obvious to them. God tells them every day you don't destroy the creation. And so then you can expose corrupt politicians that hide behind God to justify destroying the creation, exploiting resources, um, and you can you can use your idea of revelation to refine your reasoning and your arguments, but you also are accountable. So again, with Panchasila number four, the insights of wisdom that come through deliberation of representatives. So at the Pontifical Academy, they, they represented religious traditions. Those traditions do um, accept some kind of insight, intuitive insight, over and above just reasoning, because a person can have reasoning and be totally greedy and totally power hungry. And these politicians really are. They have a lot of arguments. They engage in a lot of reasoning. They use a lot of rhetoric, a lot of intellectual activity, but it's not driven by an idea of the good. So the Greeks have this idea of the good that's monism. And um, so it doesn't favor one tradition over another. But Muslims, Christians, they can have their view of revelation. They can refer to their entire habituation process as having developed that through reading the Quran or through reading Old Testament or New Testament. But ultimately, their claims about divine revelation really need to be tied down to either reasoning, rational arguments, the sciences, the social sciences, or else the kind of insight about practical wisdom that they arrive at through deliberation with representatives of other traditions. And so that's what they were they succeeded at doing at the Pontifical Academy. 
And the reason for that is clear, like this quote tells you, the most corrupt elites will refer to revelation, and yet it's entirely corrupt. It's rhetoric. Um, the same thing happened in Athens. The sophists um, were professional rhetoricians. They taught people how to use rhetoric to forward their own goals, no matter what they were, whether they were just or unjust. They taught the next generation how to appear to be just, how to use the language of justice or the language of virtue or the language of religion to get what they want, which is money, power, and fame. So this is an old problem and um, we should just be constantly calling it out. And that's what Mr. Marif does. I agree with him totally. Every point he makes is true, not just for Indonesia and not just for Islam, but it is good that he points out that Islam around the world is being used as a tool. Over the course of history, there have always been groups of Muslims who feel they are better than their co-religionists. All will be wiped out if it's not a com accompanied by good personal qualities. So that would be Aristotle's character traits. Pride based on bloodlines and origin, but without real achievement, never lasts long except through compulsion. Aristotle has... Uh, book four of his politics has um, a description of all the different virtues and vices and rational honor, okay, means doing things that go over and above what you need to do just to create a higher quality of life in your society. And that should be honored. It's honorable activity. That's why you have an honor day or we have one at our school we honor people who have gone over and above. And then he says that um, people who inherit privilege without earning it or deserve it become haughty and arrogant and they treat everybody else like they're tools. And uh, it's just great. I mean, I remember reading that and thinking, how did this guy know? Like, how did Aristotle know all this stuff? I thought I had sort of figured this out myself. There's so much when I read Plato and Aristotle, I thought, they stole all my best ideas. Like, how did they know? <laughs> and I thought, geez, if I could get a job teaching this and passing it on to the next generation, wow, that would be the most amazing job ever to get paid to do that. Not only that, if you don't get a position and get paid, nobody will pay attention to you. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm sure, Mr. Marif, this is straight out of Aristotle, but it's not true because Aristotle said it. It's just there is this common foundation, these patterns that just keep repeating over and over. Um, compulsion, okay. So these kids that inherit power and wealth, when you have an entrenched privileged class, you've got trouble. And we've got one in our society. It's all based on money. It's not based necessarily on who your parents were, on family. Uh, but it's getting to be sort of more and more like that, which makes it even worse. But anyway, so if those elites keep forcing, you know, everybody else, to bow to them. Compulsion sooner or later will trigger discontent, which in turn leads to popular rebellion against the ruling elite. The more intelligent the common people are, the harder it is to manipulate and trick them subtly, let alone coarsely. Public education is critical. So again, this is a theme we've, we've heard before. I think it's intuitively obvious, but you have to keep remembering. So. You're educating your intuition so that there are these basic intuitions, but you you know, you know keep needing to be reminded and keep including those in your worldview or in your plan for the day or plan for that year that you all keep in mind what are the most important things, the bigger picture. Um, so Plato says wisdom 
is just learning is just recollection, remembering what you already know. So that's another thing I like is that when I read Plato and Aristotle and I go, how did they know? It's just at these very basic level, these patterns, our minds take them in. We're living, you know, the human condition is this certain thing. And then when you read something or when somebody says something or when you have a certain experience, you're reminded of, oh, this is a pattern. I've seen this before. I've been in situation. I read a book about this. I saw a tragedy about this. Um, uh, we had a politician before who did this, or this is what Donald Trump is doing, right? That whole pattern recognition. That's what happened during the axial age. And that's still going on. And I like the way Mr. Marif is just continuing this tradition of pointing out these patterns. And he can give specific examples of Indonesians, but he knows it's a broader pattern. And then it's a pattern in Islam. And then it's also a pattern in the other religions. And you're going to get back to that perennial philosophy or to that primordial, uh, those primordial patterns and principles, which I'm quoting from some of the other books that I quoted from is they all keep going, finding the same foundation, which to me is very amazing. And so when I read Mr. Mari's book, I thought, wow, I just really want Indonesians to know about this book, but also to know the way I can identify with it, the way all of my scholarship has started out with the Greeks, recognizing these patterns and telling these stories and the poets creating tragedies and comedies and um, myths about this. So I can connect that with what Mr. Mari says, and also with what's happening in my own country. And then we can together connect it to India or Sri Lanka, or hopefully we can have conferences where people from all these places come together, just like the Pontifical Academy. And we can just keep reinforcing each other, keep fine tuning what's going on, keep suggesting to each other, what should we do next? How can we lead in our countries? How can we create organizations, create institutions, create educational systems that will save democracies? Because we're, we're, we're in a bad place right now. Um, and Aristotle, I said this before, is that in his politics, he's always reasoning with rulers and he says if you came to power through force really if you want to keep it and you care about keeping power and your children passing it on then you have to actually be just because if you are just then the public won't mind if you pass on the power to your children and the public won't try to overthrow you but if you're unjust your you become your position becomes more and more precarious. You make enemies. You might even make enemies among your your guards. A lot of tyrants were killed by the people appointed to guard the his their bedrooms or their houses when they're sleeping because they do have to sleep, and so they're vulnerable. Um, so justice pays, injustice costs is what Socrates tried to teach. And here Mr. Murray is saying that. Educated citizens should not always be dreaming of killing democracy because of its half failures. So if that surprised me a little bit that Indonesians, there are educated people who don't even want democracy which is odd. I mean, in the US, nobody will say they don't want it. They just, the word democracy really just means the rule of the rich. And nobody seems to pay attention or they seem to think that's okay, or they're completely manipulated by the rhetoric. But nobody will say they want it. I actually, that's not true. I had a student last semester who said, well, 
don't you think that things have gotten bad enough? We really need a strong man. I was just like, what? You don't even want, you don't even want democracy? Like not even in theory. So that that's truly scary. Um, but so in general, I haven't heard of that. I don't know how many Indonesians, how often this gets brought up. The only wise attitude to take is not to despair in the effort to repair Indonesia's democracy. Of course, this is true in America. This is true everywhere, all the way through Europe. Instead, we should educate the public. The more intelligent the common people, the harder it is to manipulate or trick them. Okay. The responsibility of the educated elite. The elite must take collective responsibility for failure and not blame each other. Among those weaknesses of Indonesia, we have seen all along are the attitudes of the elite who so easily split into factions and fail to act responsibly in guarding the pillars of democracy. So this is true no matter what your, your religious identity your ethnicity, your gender, your race. So in other countries, this can happen along different lines. Um, Mr. Marif, I think, is especially focused on the factions within Islam and then the political factions which use Islam to say, I'm the real Muslim and the other guy is a fake Muslim. Uh, yeah, I mean, just making Islam into a political weapon or a tool or even an economic weapon. I mean, I'm Muslim, so you ought to make a contract with me rather than with those, you know, Hindus or Christians. It's terrible, it's just terrible. Um, so every educated person should value democracy. Um, that just should be obvious to educated people that, uh, especially in Indonesia, so you can't get a college education without taking world religions. I know I had to teach Western thought. So I know there are a number of required courses, even at the Islamic State universities, that expose students to diversity, religious pluralism, and just to remind students that if this were an authoritarian society, if the Islamists win, you can't read this book. Not only will you not be required, you will not be allowed. And so point out to students, do you value learning this? Do you like to know what goes on in America, the rest of the world? And I would assume they say yes. And then you'll say, you know what? You can lose it. You can vote for somebody who will take it away. So please wake up. So everyone who has a college education, who goes on in a profession, and especially people who teach higher education, but people who teach at any level, should definitely value free speech, but uh, the ability to read anything they want. Um, journalism, but not just journalism, publication, free publications. You can publish books. You, the experts can look for information, trends, things to, that are, that will undermine what the politicians say and still get them published. All of that is really important to try to convey that to students but also to yourselves, for teachers to keep uh, reinforcing each other, reminding each other, inspiring each other. This is more important. And Mr. Marif says, a more serious question is, has Islam embraced by the majority of Indonesians run out of the energy to build a strong and healthy democratic system? And I think probably every Indonesian, if you really think the only way to be an authentic Muslim, an authentic Christian or Hindu or Buddhist is to have a free society, a democratic system where you aren't discriminated. So you can freely exercise your religion 
You're not going to get a job, lose a job, and no other discrimination. It's only in that context that you are an authentic Muslim because you choose it. You don't have ulterior motives. So then you should be motivated to say, as a Muslim, I want to build a strong and healthy democracy because I don't want Islam to get even more corrupted by uh, corrupt politicians and corrupt religious leaders who take over and completely distort the religion. Um, among the many reasons I'm using Marif's book is I, because I can identify with everything he says. As I said, all the same patterns occur in the US. It doesn't matter if a, nature, a nation is developed or developing. Each nation is prone to the same kinds of corruption and the elite is responsible for preserving their nation's free society. If it's not a free society like North Korea, we don't know about it anyway, but anything, any society we know anything about, even our own, has some level of freedom and we should develop it and nurture it. In most cases, a free society is one where rulers are elected. This requires an educated citizenry and leaders that want to take turns ruling and being ruled, that want their people and their nations to flourish in the Aristotelian sense, or to flourish in a way that's consistent with the way Aristotle talks about it. I am now 71 years old, one year older than Marif was when he wrote the book. He stayed productive and active until he died. Because of my natural health, and I grew up in a colonizer nation, um, and I have a clean environment, I plan to live longer, but I want to keep learning. I want to use the gifts I had to create a global community of conscientious intellectual leaders, leaders of every sector of society, to lift up our own societies by cooperating with other nations. We can recognize our common humanity and the human condition we're all coping with at this time. So I hope I have many more years, even a couple decades to work with the Indonesians. And here are a couple suggestions about books you can read about how democratic societies uh, devolved into authoritarian societies. But there's there are lots of them. Um, luckily, I live in a country where they get published. People read them. And enough people buy them and read them so that the publishers who publish them will make enough money to actually keep publishing them. So another thing we need to do is read these books, buy these books. Um, I hope that the fact that I buy them used um, means that I am supporting the publishing of them. I'm not sure, but I hope so. Um, all right, so that that's that lecture and we'll move on to the next step but just to remember the problem of overcoming colonialism is um, even within col 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 colonizer countries in my country especially we have a lot of colonizing within the U.S. the rich colonize the poor the whites colonize the non-whites the Christians colonize there's just this money sticks to money, which is what the colonizing process is about. As you control people's ability, they work too much to actually become informed about public life. They can't get that engaged because they're too busy trying to survive. Uh, they can't get a good education because the system is set up against them. There's many ways that within a free society, you have a lot of colonizing. And that creates unrest. And that's how we will lose our democracy. I understand it's not as bad as what the way we treated these colonized countries. But 
greed is greed. Power hunger is power hungry. People do not care. And everybody who isn't at the top suffers a lot.